As we continue to ask ourselves, what is social psychology? Let's explore what's trending now in social psychology. One thing that's important to understand is that social cognition research has changed over time. And it went from being very cold, viewing people like human computers. Think about Spock. He's very logical. He's very rational in the way that he processes social information. But we know in the real world, people are much more like this lady and they get emotional and they have motivations that influence their behavior. Well, new research understands that a little bit better and incorporates that into the new theories that we have. So we call those hot factors of thought, things like emotion and motivation. So taken together, the hot and the cold factors help us better understand social behavior. So that's a good thing. And I think you'll recognize that when we compare some classic research in so social psychology to the new research in social psychology. Here's another example of how social psychology is becoming more sophisticated in how we analyze how people think. Social psychologists are beginning to understand that there are some thoughts that we have that we don't have control over. They occur automatically. And then, of course, there are some thoughts that we do have much more control over. Those are controllable mental processes. Let me give you an example. You probably recognize that we live in a racist society. And if we live in a racist society, it means we're inundated with a lot of stereotypic information. Here's a good example. We get stereotypic information about black males being violent. I'm not saying that that is true. I'm not saying that they're more violent than anybody else, but we hear stereotypic information like that. And if we're inundated with that information, we're going to be influenced by that information. So automatically, in, upon encountering a young black male, we might be fearful, at least compared to what would happen when we encounter a young white male. Now that's an automatic thing. There's not too much that we can do to control that initial reaction because we're a product of our environment. However, many of us would recognize that bias within ourselves and we'd want to control for that. So if we have the motivation to control for that and we have the cognitive resources available, you know, the time, the energy, then we might try to correct for that initial bias that we know exists. So that's just uh, touching upon some really interesting research that's looking more deeply at how we think and how we don't always have as much control as we'd like to have over our initial reactions. Much more about that later. Social psychologists are also teaming up with um, people who specialize in other areas. So for example, there are some psychologists and others who study behavioral genetics. And what they're really looking at is how genes affect our social behavior. This comic shows that uh, the, the son, the younger man to the left, inherited his big butt from his dad. And although that's a funny comic, it's something that we all recognize in our day-to-day -day life that kids look like their parents. And it's, it's not something that we question, but one thing we don't think of as much is that we inherit not only our physical attributes that we can see, but also the way we think and the way we act, just propensities for how we might think and how we might act. So when we look at someone like LeBron, it's not hard to see that he's probably going to raise an amazing athlete in his son because his physical characteristics are going to be passed down. But we need to think as well that there might be some, something about the way that LeBron thinks and that amazing intellect that he has for sport might also be passed down to his son. Now let's take that out of this realm and into a realm that social psychologists might explore. Social psychologists who are looking at behavioral genetics are often looking at things like aggression. And we're trying to understand why people might be aggressive and if there might be a genetic link. This is a picture of Ariel Castro. And he's kind of a horrible guy as we're thinking about people in general. He imprisoned several women in the Cleveland area. You probably read about it in the news. And he raped them. And in fact, he fathered some children from at least uh, one of the women. And uh, we might try to understand how he can do such a thing by seeing if there might be some type of genetic component responsible. Now, that's not easy to do. So behavioral geneticists might look at father-son pairs and see if there's some type of link in genes 
um, that can account for at least some of the variability in um, criminal behavior between fathers and sons. It's not hard to find fathers and sons who have been in trouble with the law. Look at this mugshot right here to the right. I mean, it's essentially the same face. And uh, this father-son duo, they were in trouble with the law regarding some business scam. This father-son duo, they were in trouble with the law regarding transporting drugs. It's this next example where we get closer to what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. This father-son duo was arrested for having sex with the same underage girl. All right, so we're asking ourselves, is there some type of genetic link that might account for this person's behavior? Might there be something that he inherited genetically from his dad to account for the fact that he's more likely to engage in this type of criminal behavior? Well, behavioral geneticists are, are doing that type of research. Now, we need to ask ourselves though, where did dad get his genes from? And of course, we can keep looking back and back and back in time. And that's what evolutionary psychology is all about. And that's becoming much more popular in social psych to look at things from an evolutionary perspective. So here we're looking back and oftentimes to the animal world to help understand today's human behavior. So look at those chimps. They're really cute and they look really loving, but there is a dark side to chimp society. I read some fascinating research about some chimps that are simply not the dominant males. And if they're not the dominant males, they don't get mating privileges. And of course they want mating privileges. So what's really interesting is they go into a state of arrested development. They stop to mature. They don't become full size. They don't have the same characteristics as the alpha male. And as a result, the alpha male usually kind of leaves them alone. Now what happens is that when the females go into the woods to like forage for food, those young males in that arrested development stage follow them. And what do they do in the woods? They rape them. There is documented evidence that they rape them. Now when they rape them, oftentimes as a result, there's, there's often baby chimps. And researchers are able to look at that genetically to find that it is actually a successful mating strategy for them that they are raping. Now, the whole thing is very disquieting and I'm not trying to upset you about, you know, animal behavior, but my point is simply this. We are seeing some nasty behavior in the chimp world and it involves rape and that might help us inform, be informed about nasty human behavior and rape. It's just one example trying to help you understand that social psychologists are starting to examine some of this really sophisticated and interesting stuff. Social psychologists are also thinking a lot about cultural perspectives nowadays, and they're trying to weave cultural perspectives into their research. Just to help you remember what culture is all about, we're talking about some system of enduring meanings, beliefs, assumptions, and practices that are shared by some large group of people, like the American people. So think about American culture for a second. One thing that is a cultural norm is our expression of American pride. So we often see pictures of veterans or of the flag. So one thing that's kind of interesting is another important cultural thing in our society is free speech. And that's what makes this picture kind of interesting because here is where we can see two cultural values really clashing. So we have protesters who are exercising their right to free speech, but the way they're exercising that right is by desecrating another valued uh, cultural symbol, our flag. So that's just kind of an interesting example. Of course, there are lots of examples when we talk about culture. Like, so for example, one thing in our culture that is important is that there are certain people we protect. So we protect young people, we protect elderly people, this is an example of a younger person helping an older person cross the street. Again, when we're talking about culture, one thing that's very important to our culture is religious freedom. Of course, our country was built upon religious freedom. And here we can see people, men, women, Democrats, Republicans, black, white, together praying and exercising their right to religious expression. These are enduring values and practices that are shared by our culture. Well, cross-cultural research is gonna look across cultures to see how certain cultures are very similar 
and also to see how they might be very specifically different. So let's continue to talk about um, religion and how important it is in our society. This is a picture of a Roman Catholic church service. And we know that religion exists across essentially every culture when you look at the globe. This right here is a picture of um, a Sunni Muslim mosque in Iraq. Here again, just to show how important religion is across the world. Here are Buddhist services in Singapore. And here's a religious dance uh, taking place in Africa. So one thing that we're learning from this is that spirituality seems to be relatively universal. Cross-cultural research will help us see that similarity. That spirituality seems to be relatively universal. However, we don't want to downplay some of those differences that we saw. I mean, looking back through these pictures, we see lots of differences in the way that people are expressing their religion. Well, multicultural research can help us understand and appreciate some of those differences, even within our own society. Through multicultural research, we are usually looking at ethnic groups and racial groups and we're trying to look at differences even within our own culture. So again, this picture right here shows a Roman Catholic church service. And if you look at that, you see that most of the people involved are white. Um, if you know anything about Roman Catholic church services, you know that you know they go according to plan and people stay where you know they're they're seated or or maybe they're standing, but they're not getting out in the in the aisleways and people aren't calling out. Um, but that's very different from like a Baptist service. Here we see many more African Americans involved. We see people expressing themselves in very different ways. And it's just interesting that we can learn that through multicultural research, that this important shared cultural value of religious freedom is expressed in very different ways. All right, so cross-cultural research and multicultural research would help us uh, better understand um, that aspect of social behavior. And finally, let's talk about how social psychologists are teaming up with, you name it, so many other disciplines to better understand social thought and behavior at, at more sophisticated levels. We call this interdisciplinary research. So for example, behavioral economics, we're looking at um, how social psychologists are working with uh, people who study economics to study, for example, how people spend their money, how people save their money, and some of the decision making that goes into it marketing, political science, public health, even neuroscience. Social psychologists are teaming up with researchers in these fields to better understand human thought and behavior. And some of them are using new technologies as well. So, you know, we can try to understand human thought and behavior by looking at it and by asking people questions, but it's a whole other thing to actually see the brain as it works. And that's why some social psychologists, not many, but some, are doing research looking uh, at the brain via PET scans or maybe an fMRI. And of course, to better connect with today's social civilians, you know, like those of us just out there living life day to day, social psychologists are using new technology as well. So virtual reality, for example, to put people in situations that otherwise might be difficult to put them in. Using social networks just to better understand human behavior. Because, of course, we know that much of our social uh, interactions are now occurring via some type of technology. So times are really changing. And as our society continue, continues to evolve, social psychologists will need to continue to evolve in the methods that they use. I find this picture pretty interesting because you look at where we all start. You know, we start out on the playground and look at these kids Look at what they're doing. I mean, look at you've got this one kid in this other kid's face, so expressive, and they're talking. We've got some onlookers looking at other people who are probably a little bit more extroverted and have a little bit more energy. Look at how many of the kids are touching one another. I mean, they're grabbing this kid, and these kids are all together, and they're together. And and of course, that level of interaction would typically lead to adolescents who are interacting with each other. On a more sophisticated, more adult scale, you can see how they're looking each other in the eye and they're smiling and they're trying to connect with each other. And as I was mentioning, society is changing and a lot of that type of social interaction we're now seeing replaced by this type of social interaction. 
So as we're talking about new trends in social psychology, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how our tech-obsessed culture changes as a result. I'm sure you're interested in that as well. And we'll learn a little bit about that throughout the semester. So that's it for this section, but of course stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.